you got your Bibles with you, would you turn to Exodus chapter 12? Exodus chapter 12. Who's got a physical copy of the Bible with you today? Come on, the real Christians. Good job. All right. Who's got like an I version? Then, uh, all right, second, second right. No, I'm joking. You'll get to heaven after people with hard copies. All right, Exodus chapter 12. Are you there? Verse number three, we're going to read a section, and we're in the middle of a series, Summer Fest. We're looking at the biblical feasts, bi- biblical festivals in the Bible, and so that's why you'll see bunting around and inflatables after the service, and uh, the rain slightly scuppered our plans, but we're not going to be deterred. We're just going to make it happen. And uh, so Summer Fest is all about us enjoying being family together, enjoying company. And I think Paul already said uh, about feasting, there's something spiritual about eating food, and everybody said, Amen. There's something biblical about that. In fact, in the Bible, you'll see many, many feasts in the Bible as well as fasts in the Bible. And I'm personally thankful for the feasts in the Bible. And today we're going to look at uh, the Passover, and we're going super deep today. Passover. So we're going to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 12, verse number 3. If you're there, say, yes, I'm there. All right, it's because you're looking at the screens and you're cheating. You brought your I version Bible. All good. Verse number 3, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man's to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share with one of their nearest neighbors, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. In other words, if Uncle Bill is coming round for dinner, you're going to need a bigger lamb. (laughs) He hungry. And so uh, you need to measure who's coming to dinner. Make sure you've got enough. Verse 5, the animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of their houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they're to eat the meat roasted over fire, roast lamb. Oh, yes. It's going to be painful for the 12 o'clock service. Talking about roast lamb. Along with bitter herbs and bread. Sounds like a kebab. Oh, man. Lamb, herbs, and bitter bread. Made without yeast. Verse 9, do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Verse 11, this is how you're to eat it. I love the Bible. So much detail. You're to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. In other words, God was saying, you make sure you're ready when you're eating this dinner because you're getting out of here. You're getting out of here, so eat it in haste. Make sure you're ready to to run, people. Run, forest, run. On the same night, verse 12, I'll pass through Egypt and I'll strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I'll bring judgment on the foreign gods, the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord, okay? Verse 13, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see blood, when I see the blood over your house, I'm going to pass over you. I'm going to pass through Egypt, but I'm going to pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. No destructive plague will touch you when I see the blood of the Lamb. Would you just say this? It's all covered. It's all covered. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Some of you know well. It is for freedom that Christ set us. Free. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. Do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Do not let. Don't let it happen. Don't let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Would you say again one more time? 
it's all covered. It's all covered. We're going to pray and we're going to get into it. God, I just thank you for every amazing person in this room. Such a coincidence today, God, that you've brought the very best people of Greater Manchester to this room today for such a time as this. God, we believe we're called, we're chosen, and God, you're going to use us to do something amazing wherever we live, wherever we work, wherever we do life. And so we know today is a significant moment for this week and for this year. We recognize this is a transition point from uh, the old us into the new us as we walk out these doors today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 In 2011, uh, one of the biggest selling UK newspapers went out of business. They stopped, overnight stopped producing the papers, the news of the world. A red top tabloid paper and at one time selling the most copies of any newspaper in the UK. Sold millions of copies every single day and overnight stopped producing their paper. The problem was that the news of the world had been discovered. Investigators had found that some of the journalists had been tapping into people's phones to find a story. I mean, they were super desperate to find anything, to find some material on people, to find a, a, a scandal, to find a story. And in their pursuit of a scandal, they produced one right at home. You know, they were trying to find a story and in do, so doing, creating the biggest story there was ever going to be of a scandal. Tapping people's phones, investigators found they'd been tapping into nearly 6,000 people's phones to find out conversations, voicemails, just to see if there was anything they could get. And it wasn't just common people like me and you, it was people like the royal family. I mean, what has to go through your brain to think this is a good idea? Tapping phones of the royal family in order to find a story. But what was more amazing and more scandalous than the crime in and of itself was the fact, and they were busted because not only were they trying to find these stories, tapping into people's phones, but they ended up paying millions of pounds trying to cover up the scandal they were producing, the crime they were committing. And see, what shut the paper down was not even the scandal on itself. What shut them down was that people were, saw that they were plowing millions of pounds into trying to cover up their tracks. Amazing that they would work so hard with so much energy and so much resource just to cover up the crime they were committing. And yet, if I'm honest, if I look at my own life, we can often do the same in life. We can have different aspects of our life that aren't going according to plan, or, or we would rather other people don't know those sides of our life. And so we can spend much of our effort, time, and energy covering up our own story. Sometimes it's just as simple as social media. You know, where you put up every great aspect of your life. You, you, you put on social media the one story that, that makes you look amazing that week. Like that one devotional you had in the month, straight up on Instagram. Bible, angled, coffee, you know, that you don't even drink coffee, but just the hashtag, more followers, stick it on there. You know, and we can end up living a life trying to cover up and make ourselves look so much better than we actually know we are, right? Maybe it's just me. We can spend so much time and effort coming to church on a Sunday, putting on Sunday best. That's our face, right? And we just look like everything's going great. We've had a phenomenal week. Been praying hard this week, brother. That's why I'm so tired. You know, holes in your jeans because you've been spending all week on your knees. <laughs> Just praying all week. It's been a tough, tough old week interceding for, for the nation, you know. And, uh, you know, that's my, my week. How was yours? <laughs> we can cover up all the weaknesses and all the insecurities of our own life. We can even project the way we behave, 
and the way we interact with people, and we can put on a face when all we're trying to do is cover up our own weakness, our own insecurities, our own failures, our own faults. I wonder today if there's an opportunity for us not just to have a verse that speaks about a God who gives us freedom, that paid for freedom, but also said that you can experience that freedom. That we don't have to live like trying to cover up our tracks and putting all of our time, effort and energy and focus on trying to present ourselves the perfect picture to a perfect world. I wonder if we really could truly live in freedom where we could walk around life knowing, yeah, I may be weak in this area, but because God paid a price, I can experience the freedom of knowing that he's got it covered. I can live life walking around victorious. I might not be seeing the victory right now, but I am victorious. And you cannot just speak about a verse that promises a future freedom. But today you can live in that freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set you. He wants you to experience the freedom that he paid. I reckon the Passover helps us to understand the freedom that we really have. And what it is for us to live in freedom today. Not being so concerned with trying to cover our own tracks trying to cover up our weakness by putting a front of strength, by covering up our insecurities with a front of exuberance or enthusiasm or whatever it is, but rather today we can say, I've got freedom today because I know it's all covered. It's all covered. For any story throughout the Bible and any story that you would read today, you know every story has similar ingredients. And I believe this account account in the Bible leading up to the Passover and then the biblical festival of the Passover, which we're still able to celebrate and thank God for and commemorate who God is. This biblical festival was uh, out of an incredible story that firstly came from compelling characters. Every great story needs compelling characters. Every great story needs some people that you can look at, that you can believe in, that you can identify with, that you can see yourself in. And I think this Passover story has those people. We're going to rewind 650 years thereabouts from the time of Exodus chapter 12. And we're going to go back a book in the Bible, 650 years. And so just for a second, we're going to go Wayne's World on you. And if you know, you can join me right now, and we're going to go back in time. If you don't know, get to know. 650 years, Genesis chapter 12, God speaks to a man called Abram. Abram is married to his wife called Sarai. Abram and Sarah are without children, and they're believing God, they're hoping for children, Uh, they really want children, and yet to this day, they have no children. God speaks to Abram, and he says, Abram, I have chosen you. In Genesis chapter 12 is the first time God really speaks to him. It blows Abram's mind to recognize there is an almighty God out there who's now speaking to him. The word of God comes to a regular, ordinary man. The only difference is he's been chosen by God. And so God speaks to Abraham and says, I've chosen you. You're on the planet for a purpose. You're here for a reason, and I'm going to use you. Over the course of time, he speaks to Abraham and unveils what this choosing is actually going to produce in him and through him. Genesis chapter 15, God speaks to this same man again. He says, go out of your tent. Look up into the skies. Look at the stars. As many as stars are in the sky, so shall your offspring be. What? Remember, Abraham and Sarai have how many children? None. And now you're getting me to look up into the sky 
And you're saying, so shall my offspring be. God, you got the wrong person. Who are you speaking to? Why would you even dangle that carrot in front of me? You know what I've been going through. You know what we've been believing for and not seen anything. You know I'm 75 years old. Like this is a crazy word from God. God, you've got the wrong person. This word would have been right, maybe, if it was 50 years ago. God, your timing is is just totally wrong. What you're speaking to me is not me. And yet God continues to speak to Abraham time and time again. Have you ever had a word from God? You thought, who are you speaking to here? Maybe I just ate too much pizza or curry the night before because that does not sound like God to me. That doesn't sound like a God who knows what I'm going through because that word is out there. Anybody? Abraham's received this word from God that he cannot get his head around and yet God continually speaks over and over again. He says again, walk out onto the seashore. Look at the grains of sand on the seashore. So shall your offspring be. This word of God continually comes to Abraham simply because God has picked Abraham. This compelling character, Abraham, receives the word of God and he goes from just one man with one word from God. And over the course of time, Abraham and Sarah receive a son. You know what the son was called, their first son? Isaac. You know what Isaac means? God, he laughs. Sarah's initial response when Abraham had said what God spoken to me, Sarah laughed in Abraham's face. And then God says, do you know what I'm going to do? You're going to call your son Isaac. God, he laughs. Because God always gets the last laugh. Maybe when God spoken to you, you were like, that is ridiculous. You watch what God's able to do because he will always have the last laugh. And so when God speaks, he, he enable, his ability is to take one word from God and over the course of time, through Abraham and Sarah, their descendants come to Exodus chapter 12. There are 600,000 men plus women plus children. I mean, there are crowds, descendants as numerous as stars in the sky and sand on the seashore. This promise has been fulfilled simply because one man received one word from God. I wonder what could happen today if you opened yourself up to hearing one word from God. What could happen from one God, one word from God, and one available person who says, yes, I receive your word. It might be ridiculous, but I believe I'm chosen to carry this word. And God is able to produce an army through you. If today you'd say yes to a word from God. I don't know if I'm preaching to anyone today, but come on. If you're ready to receive a word from God, he's able to produce something of multiplication in your life. Abraham, over the course of time, sees the word of God being fulfilled. And this compelling character, Abraham and Sarah, who were faced with impossibility and yet believed God. And so the same is true for us today. The same way Abraham and the Israelites were God's chosen people, today you are God's chosen people. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 says, He chose us. In him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everybody loves being chosen. I don't know if you were ever in a line at school and being picked for a sports team. Everybody loves being chosen. The first one to be picked out. I picked you on my team. Maybe you are the milk monitor at school. Any milk monitors out there? Come on. This is your time. When do you ever have this moment? Make the most of it. Shout out to the milk monitors. 
Come on. Register monitors. Any register monitors out there? Come on, take, take, take your moment. I mean, you were in year one, and you had like the register, that big blue register that was bigger than you, you know? They're like dragging it through the class. But because you've been selected, because this week you're register monitor, you're carrying it past the year six class like, oh yeah, come on, look at me now, register monitor. You got the respect of the school because you get three minutes out of class to take the register back to the office. Everybody loves being chosen, right? We all love being selected. And the good news today is every single person in this room, you have been chosen by God himself. As God selected Abraham for a word today, he selects you. As he chose the Israelite people today, he chooses his church to do something significant. And so as much as Abraham, who could not believe that God had picked him out of the crowd, today we sit here, just regular, normal people with average weeks, and yet God has picked us out of the crowd. He selected us. How much bigger and better does it feel to walk back into your workplace knowing, I'm chosen. This week, walk around your office like, I'm register monitor. You've been selected and picked out by God for a purpose. Every incredible story has a compelling character, but it also has great challenge or great crisis. And in this story of the Israelite people, the, the nation of Israel, God's people, they went from this incredible moment of knowing they were called and chosen to facing incredible challenge and crisis. The people had grown to over 600,000 men, women, children, over a million people, a huge nation of people looking for their territory. And they found themselves in Egypt and the Egyptian king looked at them and through the lens of his own personal insecurity, he saw this people and thought, wow, they've become too numerous for us. We're going to have to show these people who's boss. We're going to have to clamp down because before too long, if these people look around and, and look at how powerful, how significant, how called, how chosen they are, they're going to make a difference in this place. And so they begin to restrict the Israelite people. They begin to put limitations on them. And before too, not, not, after not so long, they began to treat them as slaves. They treated them harshly. And so the Egyptians used the Israelite people to do their work, their dirty work for them. They were oppressed. They were pushed down. They were treated like second-class citizens. And so they faced right now a personal crisis. It doesn't matter how many times you can, tell, you can be told you're chosen and you're called. Every single person will find crisis or challenge in their life. The Israelite people, God's chosen people, were now in the middle of an incredible crisis of dramatic proportions. Many of them were looking around going, what hope do we have? We're just going to die in this place. And our leader's telling us we're called, we're chosen, we're here for a purpose, and yet look at the circumstance we're in. Have you ever walked away from a Sunday feeling incredible, responded to an altar call, going, God, you've selected me. You've chosen me. I'm on the planet for a reason. And you get back into your regular week and something hits you like a train. A bill through the post, a harsh word spoken to you, an atmosphere of negativity, people treating you as slaves, looking down on you, and you like a, a ton of bricks in your face, go, I thought I was called and I'm chosen. Today, I want to encourage you that you are facing crisis and challenge in the same way God's people did. But the good news is, 
And the reason we looked at who these compelling characters was before their great challenge in crisis is because our purpose and the promise of God always precedes our problems. And so whatever challenge in crisis you're facing today, you've got to focus not on what you're going through, but who started the journey in your life. It was God who spoke to you. And if he starts something, he always completes things. And so if God spoke to you, he will see that word to completion. And so today you're just in the middle of one of the greatest stories that you're on the planet to live. Every incredible story has compelling characters, also has great challenge and great crisis, but it always turns around to incredible conquests. You're here today, whatever you're facing this week, in the middle of challenge and crisis, you're here to turn one more page. Because if you today would just make a commitment just to keep turning the page, eventually you'll find a new chapter. And that new chapter's title is Great Conquests. You're on the planet called and chosen by God. You are the compelling character in this day and age to make a difference on the face of the planet. Yes, you may face challenge and crisis, but if you would today just commit to turning the page, you're going to find your own conquest that God is going to take you through and is going to take you out and is going to set you free so you can experience freedom that God has got for you. Every amazing story has a conquest. These compelling characters, the Israelites, who were now trapped in slavery, God raised amongst them a character called Moses, who had seen both sides. He'd been born an Israelite and yet grown up an Egyptian. And so he sees from both, perspective, both perspectives and God uses this man to set the people free. And over time, these people looking down on slavery and how are we going out, to gonna get out of here? And God's crazy idea, his crazy plan is to send plagues on the whole people in order to change the king's heart. Moses continually goes back on behalf of the Israelites and says, my people are born for their land. They're born for freedom. Let my people go. Herod says over and over again, no, I'm not, gonna, not a chance. I mean, what would you do if you're going to lose your entire workforce overnight? Herod says, I am not letting that happen. God sends another plague. Moses comes back. Let my people go. Herod says, not a chance. These plagues continually come. Wave after wave after wave of intense plagues. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you've been hit by plagues of mental illness and plagues of sickness and, and, and plagues in your mind, in your spirit, thinking, I'm just living this life where there's this promise of God that I'm told about for freedom, but I'm never going to be able to live in freedom. Plague after plague, crisis after crisis, challenge after challenge. And the Israelites are in that moment. Are we ever going to experience and live in the promise of the Word of God? And the tenth plague was to come. God said on this tenth plague, I want you to sacrifice a lamb, a perfect lamb without blemish. It's not being spoiled by anything. I want you to sacrifice that lamb. I want you to take the blood. And I want you to put the blood over your home, over the doorposts. I'm going to send a final plague. This is going to be your freedom. A plague of destruction will come through Egypt. It will pass through the land. But because of the blood over your house, it will pass over your home. Matthew chapter 26, 
Jesus himself is celebrating the commemoration of this moment, the Passover festival, the Passover feast. As he's celebrating with his closest, he breaks the bread. Says, this is my body, it's going to be broken for you. He gives them the wine, says, this is my blood, it's going to be shed for you. And he says, in the same way, they poured out blood over the doorposts. And that blood protected them. That blood said to the Israelites, God's got this all covered. He's got this, it's all covered. Today, you get to spread the blood of Jesus Christ over your home. When Jesus was sacrificed on the post, and blood was smeared all over that post. That post represented you, it represented your home. And today in the same way, the Israelites looked at the doorpost and said, God sees us through the blood on the post. Today God sees you through the blood on the post. And so today you can look at the post, and you can say, God, it's all covered. I don't need to cover up any longer. I don't, don't need to cover my guilt. I don't need to work hard covering my shame. I don't need to be stronger and, and cover my weakness. I don't need to try and put on a Sunday best. I don't need to pretend like everything's great. I don't need to cover everything myself. All I need to do is say, Jesus, it's all covered. The blood of Jesus says it's all covered. Whatever your crisis is, Whatever your challenge is today, I want you to take communion today and declare over your life, it's all covered. It's all covered. It's all covered. We're going to take communion in a moment. There's four stations, two at the back. And I think two at the front here and here. And in your own time as we worship, Jake's going to lead us. We're going to have time just to reflect and thank God. But we're going to take this Passover meal, our communion, today. We're going to take the bread. We're going to take the juice. Are we going to look from a perspective of victory as the Israelites ate this meal saying, we're getting ready to get out of here. It was a significant transition moment from the old to the new. What I believe is going to happen right now is you're going to go to the station. Are you going to go with your old? You're going to go with your baggage. You're going to go with your weakness. You're going to go with your guilt and your shame. And you're going to almost drag yourself there. And you're going to dump it. You're going to leave it. You're going to drop it at the station. You're going to say, Jesus, it's all covered. It's all covered. As I take your body, I take your, the juice that represents your blood. I thank you, God, because of that blood over the post. I can say no destructive plague is going to touch me. No mental sickness is going to touch me. No guilt, no shame is going to touch me. Jesus, it's all covered. And you're going to transition from the old, and you're going to go back to your seat victorious. A new person, a new person. And then you're going to lift both hands. You're going to lift your voice and you're going to worship at the top of your voice with all you've got, shouting a victory song, shouting a new song. So would you stand to your feet right now? Lift your hands. God, we thank you for your blood shed for us. We walk to these places with our guilt, with our shame, with our baggage, but we walk back victorious. And so we thank you, God, for this communion moment. And we celebrate the new thing you're doing in each one of us. We worship with all we've got. Because we know it's not covered by us. It's covered by you. We can boldly approach the throne of grace. Because today, it's all covered. It's all covered.